different efforts, all of which um, go some portion of the way towards answering that question. I don't think we'll get an answer. Um, but uh, I'll talk about some, some things that I work on um, personally uh, that are related. So first um, is the One Laptop Per Child project, which was founded in 2005. And that fetching green laptop there is the reason why a lot of the text in this presentation is makes your eyes hurt. Um, you get used to it after a while. Um, the One Laptop Per Child project distributed uh, 2.4 million laptops all over the world. Um, there were three generations of hardware that we, that we built um, and manufactured and deployed. Um, they ship with a software stack, which is all open source, um, based on Linux and uh, a specialized uh, operating system for educational content called Sugar, um, which is designed to be easy for kids to use and, importantly, for preliterate kids to use. Um, so it doesn't have you know, menus where you have to read the menus in order to figure out how to make things go. Um, very rich grammar based. And there's no, in fact, no text in the interface. Um, with deployments worldwide. So I'm going to start by talking about our deployment in Uruguay, um, which uh, in many ways is, is one of the most successful. Um, Uruguay provided one laptop per child, so one laptop to every kid in the country um, who is enrolled in first through sixth grade, so six to 12 year olds. Um, that's almost 400,000 children and another 18,000 teachers. Um, and installed on every machine, among the other educational software, there's uh, um, lots of, of different things that we deployed. And what we see is uh, use of a constructionist uh, approach to uh, education. Um, and so there are lots of things to explore and to learn by doing. Um, but among the other things uh, was an offline slice of the Spanish Wikipedia that a coworker of mine, Chris Ball, um, spearheaded and a, a bunch of volunteers helped create. Um, and uh, it was a selection of articles that were deemed useful for education. I think this was before the, the Wiki Schools Project, so what we see created its own subset um, with images that were down sampled so that they could fit entirely on the this rather small memory of the machine. Um, and uh, in the course of evaluating the One Laptop Per Child project in Uruguay, um, they conducted a number of surveys of, of the kids, and this is of the top eight or so, you know, we deployed dozens and dozens of different educational programs on laptops. Um, but by far and away, the children's favorite activity was navigar, which is to browse the web. Um, and uh, when you dig into that a little bit more, you find out the thing that they're browsing on is Wikipedia. We have an offline slice of Uruguay what was um, very connected. It was one of the reasons that Uruguay One Laptop for Child project succeeded well is that they did a very aggressive um, uh, internet connection connectivity project for their school. So just about every school had a connection, not necessarily a fast connection, but a connection to the internet. Um, and so, uh, and the, um, I'll show a picture later, but the, the offline browser for Wikipedia also looked very much like a web browser. So these sort of things get confused in their mind whether they're actually online or whether they're using the offline slides. But, by far and away, um, both when you ask the kids what their favorite activity was and what um, the teachers said they were most able to use in, in classroom and lesson plans um, uh, was Wikipedia. Um, so this planted a seed that, that uh, I continue to re return to in later work. But um, they also, this is a segment of a free text survey of what do you like about your exo. And a lot of them are about being able to find answers to things on Wikipedia. I like because I can look for information on the internet. I like learning about lots of things. It's beautiful to be able to um, to, to, to find information, get information on the internet. Uh, I like to learn about other places, um, and uh, it helps me to learn more and and, uh, and look for information. Um, so that that was um, a little bit surprising at the time. Uh, we we invested all this energy into really cool like measuring applications and learning to program and physics applications and all this stuff. And the thing which made the most difference in the teachers and the students' lives was what you need. Um, so uh, the second effort, uh, also one laptop for child deployment, this time in Peru, um, they deployed even more laptops, although their population is, is much larger, 29 million people, so the percentage of the population who got laptops was smaller. Um, 
but it didn't enjoy nearly as much success as the Uruguay project, and there were lots of um, reasons for that. Um, one of them being that uh, OPC's goal, especially originally, wasn't to teach literacy. And, you know, uh, some of the, the initial criticism from the project came from a World Bank-sponsored project which gave people standardized tests with bubbles to fill in and said, hey, they didn't improve on their bubble tests. And you're like, yes, but did they learn to learn? Are they learning physics? All these things that you can't actually teach. Are they learning to research stuff? Um, but that's the kind of incomplete answer and some other questions. They had a lot of problems with deployments. Their schools were a lot more rural, so there was a lot more problems with maintenance and keeping electricity to the, the, the laptops. Um, so we were puzzled for a while. I mean, we investigated lots of things. Um, the first hint as to sort of the root cause um, was a census evaluation in 2007 of the 180,000 teachers who were charged with, with educating kids in Peru. Um, so that's 10 times the number of teachers in Uruguay, again, sort of giving an idea of the scale. Um, and 62% of the teachers did not read at a, at a sixth grade level. And in fact, 27% of the teachers did not read at all. Um, and so suddenly it's a lot less surprising that the kids aren't learning to read. Right? Um, and they were you know, obviously somewhat appalled by this. And they did a crash course to try to educate their teachers. And still, 13% of the teachers, even after somewhat intensive remediation efforts, still were not functionally there. Um, so um, that's the sort of second learning point here is, you know, we've got all this written material, um, which when used well, like in Uruguay, can really help kids. It, and, and it's almost a whole world of them. In Uruguay, they, they call it the W because the icon is on there. Laptop. And so, you know, I, there's lots of stories about kids being really excited that they, they learned something in the W or that um, uh, someone in school, they mentioned the planet Mars, and they're like, oh yeah, I was reading about Mars in the W. Um, and so, you know, that, that kind of thing is, is, is really exciting to me. But you can't get there if you can't read. And in Peru, it's we've discovered the hard way that it's hard to learn to read if no one around you can read. Um, so this is the, the third um, project I'm going to talk about, which is um, a follow-up project at OBC, a sort of research investigation. We're trying to figure out, so you know, we can succeed in situations like Uruguay. What can we do about kids further out, who are even further from connectivity or further from good teachers? Is there anything we can do for them? So um, certainly the best thing the most valuable resource to a student is a teacher. You've got a good teacher, you're doing really well. Um, but teachers are expensive, and especially in a lot of these smaller communities, the cost to have someone in your town who is not contributing to your village, but is just teaching kids, is, is really expensive. Um, and can we do anything for these people? Do we have to abandon them? If you don't have anyone near you who can read, is there any way you can learn to read? And so that's what this. Um, pilot was about. Um, this was a, a small project, um, about 30 kids in, in two villages in, um, in Ethiopia, villages with no literate adults at all, and um, two days walk from the nearest school, and the parents needed their kids to work in the field, so the kids didn't think that two days walk to school very often at all. Um, and uh, so we uh, had a number of different questions we were trying to answer all at once, as you do with a, a pilot project, you're trying to learn as much as you can with as few resources as possible. Um, some of the biggest were just, can we actually keep laptops running? Right? Can, we, um, we'll, yeah, can we power them? They don't have any, any source of power. So these were solar powered. These were commercial tablets, which was another thing um, to do. It. So since the original XO, commodity um, mobile hardware has gotten much, much better. Um, the XO was optimized for a particular use case that was probable, kids could pour stuff on the keyboard. Um, but since that time, touch screens had, had taken off and you don't really have to worry about kids pouring stuff in the touch screens if there's no keyboard, or it's pouring stuff in the keyboard if there's no keyboard. So trying a lot of things at once. Um, what can we teach with a uh, touch base interface? Can we actually um, teach them? And importantly, um, can we make steps on the road to um, to, to learn to literacy. Um, and we used a phonics-based approach, um, uh, which was originally developed called Rabo for um, 
dyslexic kids um, because it turns out that thinking very carefully about all the little pieces that you need to learn to read is a good way to sort of approach this problem from scratch. If you don't have uh, any teacher to guide you through it, you need some kind of structure to, to sort of guide you along that road. Um, it's not just going to hit you like a light bulb one day. Um, uh, this was also in English um, for this particular uh, pilot, which English is an official language of Ethiopia and is a useful commercial language in Ethiopia as well. Um, and this was mostly because adding a foreign language on top of everything else was, well, <laughs> both made the task more challenging for us. And you know, if we can teach kids who, in these, this case, did, were not fluent English speakers um, basic English literacy, um, that was a kind of powerful thing to be able to do if you can do it right in time. Um, and uh, so yeah, the, so um, that's one of the tablets that we deployed along with some of the, the video content. Um, and here I'm, I'm cutting to the chase. Um, these are, you know, it's a very small project. Numbers aren't statistically terribly meaningful, but this shows competency demonstrated in an app, which I'll talk about in a second, on um, some basic literacy skills. And it's sort of in order from easiest to hardest. And you know, you found out the, the basic questions of the pilot were answered. We were able to keep that laptops running. Um, they didn't get stolen. They didn't wander off. They didn't break. Um, we have a, a reasonable mechanism to keep in charge of the solar car. And the kids remained interested and involved, which is another um, criticism a lot of people had at the time that kids, you know, kids get bored. You give them a tablet, and they'll eventually wander off and, and not learn anything. But the kids maintained interest um, long term in the tablets and, and continued, you know, making steady progress on literacy goals. Uh, well, the, this stopped less than a year after we got them. But that's still, if you've seen a kid play with toys, that's a long time for a kid to, to stay interested in one thing. Um, so here are some of the things. Um, and this app did, which is pretty basic, um, was based the quantifiable results, which I saw. We deployed a lot of stuff, a lot of video content, um, uh, and uh, commercial apps where we could find ones that were appropriate. Um, but the things that we could quantify were basic matching tasks. So we could tell, are they getting better at matching sounds to letters, for example. Um, so, yep, both of them. Ah. The, uh, well, let's see, let's do this in order. We have the name of the letter, the sound the letter makes, a word with a letter in it, um, or different words. Um, and this particular set of things is a little incomplete, but basically teaching the three, those three, those four letters, B, C, M, and T. So cat, mat, bat. Um, and uh, there was a, a very simple, not exciting but like black screen matching game where things appear on the bottom and one of the video clips played and kind of press it to match. Um, there's some interesting stories there. Originally, when you chose the wrong answer, it made this like, which the kids thought was much better than the actual like right answer down. So <laughs> in the early stage of the project, we actually got the first idea that they were actually making progress and knew what the right button was because they consistently hit the wrong button so many times in a row. Like, if, I, if you hit the wrong button, different wrong buttons, but 50 times in a row, it means that you know what the right button is and you're deliberately not pressing it, right? So, um, so yeah, there, there's, some, there's always some interesting effort here in trying to tune the rewards um, to, uh, to, to make kids kind of do the right thing. Um, and uh, so one was a very simple matching game, and uh, oops, a slightly more complicated one was uh, called Nell's Balloons, um, where you pop the balloons by, by matching. This is the sort of very beginning where it's sort of associating a color with a, um, with a balloon. Um, and uh, in this game, there were uh, six levels which taught a total of eight different letters, eight words, and it also taught some beginning grammar articles and plurals that words could have these things at the end or at the beginning that meant something. Cat was different from cats, right? So you have to match more than one cat with the word cats. Um, and in keeping with the balloon theme, but when you finish the level here, you've got a clip from a space balloon flight, so you also got a little bit of science. You got to see the world from space, more or less, near space. Um, so, um, so this, this is basically the, um, the Ethiopia pilot, and, and 
you know, I can demonstrate that there's there's uh, some basic data to get this is actually uh, has a reasonable chance of working. We can get to the eight word level, and um, in theory, if you can get there, you can teach them another eight words, and another eight words to get to the point where around 200 words you start being you know, usefully literate. Um, uh, and so this is the first part where things that could, that could help. How can the community help out? So it turns out that a really useful thing for education of the source is an open source database of words, their pronunciations, and pictures or illustrations of those words, especially for simple nouns and verbs. Um, and we have a lot of those pieces almost out there. There's Open Clip Park, for example, um, which, which if you're familiar with it, you might recognize some of those pictures earlier from, from being there. Um, but uh, um, especially if you want to sort of progress to the thousand words language, someone needs to have a database of a thousand different words to, to teach. Um, and this was really hard for me to do all by myself. Um, and uh, this forms the basis for vocabulary exercises and more interesting teaching tools. It's not something that's just basic literacy. You can do on larger and larger words. Um, and some of this information is already there in the dictionary and Wikipedia. Um, it's just a matter of, of coding it. And the other thing, the, the next step is for bilingual education, having what we have at Wikidata, which is word correspondences between languages, is very helpful too. So you can imagine that uh, these kids spoke Oromo, um, which is one of the the plurality language in Ethiopia, the non-official language of Ethiopia. Um, uh, and um, having anything that would give them a hint that this word that they're learning cat in addition to looking like this was your own word this, right, would help a lot in terms of advancing um, uh, bilingual education. And that's something that I learned in OPC, in terms of OPC deployments was very useful. A lot of minority languages have to coexist with a um, with an official language of some sort, and providing kids um, and learners the tools to work between them and to learn their own language as well as the majority language at the same time helps um, uh, helps both. Um, right. So um, the fourth step here is uh, analysis with Wikipedia, where there's a, a prototype. Um, and in the interest of time, I'm not going to show you the live one. That's a, a screenshot. This is actually. The interface very closely matches Wikibrowse, which is the, um, the offline snapshot that we just de deployed in, in your way through. Um, so the idea of Nails Wikipedia is, is for that next step. Now that you've taught them, say, 50 words, 100 words, how are they going to keep pulling themselves up out of good stress? And we have a lot of content in Wikipedia that can let students learn a lot about the world and, and keep enlarging their vocabulary. Um, but can we make this accessible to language learners? Um, so Nels Wikipedia is a, a read-along browser that will read you articles. Um, you know, read you a word if you press the word, read you the whole article if, if you need help with that. Um, designed for literacy learning, it's built with web technologies. Um, and an ancillary point, the articles, unlike a lot of offline slices, the articles can be updated um, from within the app themselves. So when you have connectivity, um, you're reading the most recent version of the article, and that's stored then for when you don't have connectivity. That was in Uruguay and Peru, they are still using, as far as I know, a 10-year-old Wikipedia slice, because the machines themselves don't have the capability of updating that slice. Um, and it's hard to get to every machine in the country and, and get them all updated. Um, and this uh, Nels Wikipedia uses the simple English Wikipedia, which is another wonderful thing the Wiki community has created. Um, to help, again, bootstrap up the, the ladder of literacy. Um, so some of the open challenges, how, how do you better support literacy learners in, through the Wikipedia content? So just finding the article on cat is hard if you don't know the word cat. Um, are there better indexes that, can, that are more useful for someone who's just learning the language? Um, you know, they can read you the article on cat, but first you have to find it. Um, Again, uh, I support for multi-language learning. The language links are really cool. If I press on any link in a Wikipedia article, the data is there in Wikidata to tell me that word in any one of a number of different languages. Um, and offline editing tools are something I'm, I'm really passionate about. They, they tend to get um, uh, the short end of the stick because they're hard. But Wikipedia is not a read-only resource, right? To be a full member of the Wikipedia community, you eventually have to get to the point where you can not only read Wikipedia, but you can write, and you can start writing about the world around you and the things that you care about. Um, uh, 
Um, so, um, so this uh, recap quickly the, the, the sort of four projects and the four quick lessons. Um, Uruguay loves Wikipedia. Wikipedia was really important in the old BC deployment there, and a lot of kids <laughs> have used the, the content that, that uh, all of you have helped create. Um, Peru tells us that teachers are important and not to forget about how you actually teach um, the content you provide. Um, Ethiopia uh, opened some questions about how to create better open content for language learning, um, which is a, a, a section which isn't well addressed in the community um, at the moment. And Nels Wikipedia asked us to imagine what a Wikipedia interface specifically for language learning would be about um, and ways you can help. Anytime you add an interlanguage link to Wikipedia, you are helping. Um, and uh, anytime, to, to a large degree, anytime you add an image or a video, even if it's trivial, especially if it's trivial, like, does the article on running have a picture of someone running yet? Like, if you're learning the word to run, that's useful. Um, and there's lots of code which you can contribute. So there's a GitHub repository for most Wikipedia, for example. There's others you can contact me. Uh, I'm C. Scott on the projects. Um, and uh, yeah, maybe I should use something other than what I'm doing for that. But thank you very much. Uh, offline editing tools. Um, so it turns out that there's not that many editors of, for example, the Aroma Wikipedia. Okay? So you don't have to be too fancy about it. If you store the old version of the page that you had and the new version that after you finish making your changes, the next time that you have connectivity. So intermittent connectivity is very common in a lot of these places. So even in, um, in these villages, someone will take a trip to the school two days away or to the nearest big village because they need to do some business. So they'll have intermittent connectivity. So if you can give them ways to store that change so that the next time they have connectivity, it can get uploaded. And assuming there's no conflicts, yada, 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 yeah. apply, right? Um, and if there's conflicts, that's the interesting part. Some of those conflicts can be merged. Some of them um, can be dealt with on the server side. So uh, you know, I'm not the, the huge expert here, but there, I know there are um, with some of the flag revision ideas, there, there's some idea that you could upload your new version of the article for another editor to come in and manually merge the bells. Right? So do you have people to teach them the editing process of Wikipedia? So how do, do they get the editing process? I mean, they're okay, right? So yeah, so, so that was actually part of the lesson plans in Uruguay, for example. Um, and uh, you know, one of the, they were learning not only about Wikipedia as an encyclopedia, but also how to, how to contribute back. And, I think usually the first thing they wrote about was their school, which they all knew. Um, and uh, they could take pictures around their school and upload those. So um, again, that's with teachers, right? Without teachers, it's, it's, you know, it's that much harder. But you know, that's a challenge for us all, I think. Uh, let's go here and then there. Uh, well, you talked about having uh, sound clips for words, et cetera, to teach language. And there's a website you might know, which is portable.com. Uh, so, but, but it's not really free, like Wikipedia is free. So, have you considered one of the reasons so many people contribute to Forvo is it's so easy to just click record and then there's a flash thing which you just use your microphone, speak a word, and uh, it starts after two seconds? So, uh, have you? Yeah, so there's, there's lots of, I mean, there's lots of pieces of the problem, I guess. So, one of the things I'm, I'm sort of advocating for is, is, a, is a coherent way that will bring all these efforts together and make one thing that holds together so you don't have to grab this from there. And the other ancillary point is that actually seeing that movement is very important when you're learning language. Um, I mean, when you make a development tool, it, it makes it easier because right now it's so difficult to record anything for Wikipedia. But I think it discourages like 97% of the people. Yeah, I'll agree with that. That's a lovely talk. Um, so I have a slightly naive and quite technical question, which is whenever people talk about offline editing and the way it's stuck there, it's very much the model where I go, this is kit, this is kit, this is version control. What's the difference between offline editing and the standard problem of version control? Is it just keep committing and then push it something? Um, I would say the hardest problems are actually user interface. As, um, does anyone need me to repeat questions? I'm sorry. Can you say that again? 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 Can you say
to say. summarize the question. So how is offline editing different from Git? How about that? Um, and uh, I guess my short answer is I think you know there's there's no inherent technical limitation there. It's all a matter of putting all the pieces together, getting something that, that is easy for kids to use. If anything, the hardest technical part is actually the network connectivity model. Um, Git actually has recently grown some features for that too. But you know having an easy way to take all your edits, bundle them together, give them to someone on your speed key or whatever, or on your cell phone, and then when they get to connectivity, they all get uploaded to the cloud. Like getting that so that it works without a lot of extra that thought is, is I think, the hardest problem that is mostly a user interface problem, not a um, technical problem. Any other questions? Sure. So for Nell Wikipedia, I'm I'm most I'm talking about text synthesis mostly, um, but it's certainly um, so in the Ethiopia pilot, I was experimenting with two different. I was sort of working on the text synthesis part for Wikipedia as well as some some simple language learning stories where I read them myself because I was the person working on it. Um, so you can have high quality readings for certain selected materials and then give access to the whole rest of the world by text synthesis, which is not as good. But again, unfortunately, we're talking about what we can do for people that we can't do better for. Um, and, uh, Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. Hi everybody, my name is Martin and this is the session on making a country's education system with media compatible. I'm going to be talking about my country, I'm going to be talking about the UK. Your country may be different. I can't tell you about your country, but I hope you'll find something in what I say that you can adapt and use and maybe resolve to do some action as a result of this, this talk. Um, but firstly I'm going to say where I'm coming from. So I am a Wikipedia. I edit Wikipedia on the topic of psychology. I think that's a key part of, of what the, the good that Wikipedia can do in the world. Imagine everybody having access to the best, most reliable scientific information on mental illness, on human happiness, on human error, on prejudice and stereotypes, and uh, social skills. I don't think people go to Wikipedia to learn more about social skills. Wouldn't that be great if that happened? I want that to happen in my lifetime. But it's been painful, and at points I have despaired. And a few years ago, I, I, when I first gave a presentation at Wiki Confluence, I, I said I despair about psychology on Wikipedia. It's, what's there is, is not very good, it's not much scientific content, it's more for pop psychology, and there's so few editors working on it, I have no hope of ever getting good. The only grounds for optimism at that time uh, came from Mazarin Banerjee. Mazarin Banerjee was the then new president of the uh, Association for Psychological Science. And she was a big fan of Wikipedia. And she said, psychology is rubbish on Wikipedia. Who's to blame? Well, the 
uh, the researchers and teachers of psychology, if they're not contributing, they've got no one to blame but themselves. And so she initiated the A plus Wikipedia initiative, getting researchers to edit, getting uh, academics to get their students out. So at the time, I conveyed my pain at being a psychology Wikipedia editor in a noise. I said it's like, oh, oh help. <laughs> but the students did not, and they have I think, saved Wikipedia. It's like, now I'm going, yeah, 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 not bad. Occasionally, yes. Sometimes, oh, disappointing. They didn't really do much with that article. But uh, yeah, the next year, students will come along and do something. So it's been great for me because Improving psychology on Wikipedia now has been less about me editing articles myself and more about me giving friendly feedback to students who are working on updating stuff. And this is mostly in North America that this happens, uh, I've got this great amount of content. I, I'm talking about the UK, so I, I should credit the UK institutions and students who overhauled stuff that I've seen. So it was a while ago, but if you read about academic concepts connected to self esteem, then you've got to thank the University of Southampton and their final year students. This year there's a great project, I think it's like a case study of you know, just how, how you should do it, on the psychology of internet use uh, from the University of Hull that I had a lot of interaction with. The students worked really hard on the internet addiction disorder article. They worked really hard. They came back again and again and they revised again and again the internet addiction disorder article. I got a bit worried. Anxiety management. Difficult. Can you imagine boiling down all of the research on anxiety management and sifting through finding the important thing and digesting to Wikipedia? So potentially terrifying assessment, but the students pull this through. And ostracism, somebody worked on the ostracism article and nobody interacted with them. They just did it on their own to make have ostracism research. So this stuff goes on under the radar, it doesn't get noticed. Uh, it gets noticed when somebody plows an academic just plans and they don't engage with the community or with the education community or the notice board and just send students in and that's what creates the angst and uh, the debates on the discussion boards and so on and I'm part of that, I've had to clean up messes like a lot of us but still because there's all of this good quality scientifically based stuff appearing on Wikipedia it's definitely a net positive, I think not just a net positive it's crucial to the actual success of what Wikipedia is trying to do to have the Education program and to have education activities supported. So, what I'm trying to tell academics is that there's a pot of educational gold in Wikipedia. It is not because it's giving the students an experience of publication, it's giving so it's actually demanding in terms of research skills, it's giving them a realistic experience of knowledge work where they won't have to research and digest for another audience, uh, an experience of group collaboration, an experience of creating material rather than doing that just has to be receiving. It it's, does all the things that we say we're trying to do in university education. But that it's difficult. But you just don't plow and you've got to have skills. I want, what the fact is, we kind of intimidated and put off, so they don't just, just plow in. That, um, yeah, you've got to have access to the right amount of support and you've got to have the computer expertise. And so if I do outreach to a lot of academics, a lot of them think, we're not up to this, we don't have the skills yet, to, we, we can't have enough support for the students, and so they don't do it. That's a good outcome. And it's not steer clear if there are things like the education program, the education module, the pre primary case studies stepped up. And I realise I'm changing what professionals do, and I realise that you don't do that in one message, usually. You don't say, here's a good idea, and then they, they change how they work in their jobs. I think your experience may be different, that you need to get a message to people four times, probably from four different sources. So for them to go from, well, okay, that happens, oh, that's good, to, oh, maybe we could do it, to, oh, this is relevant, we should do it, to, to them actually doing it, to actually um, implementing it in their work. And in the back of my mind, I'm thinking about different stages. So there's an outreach stage where I just get on the agenda for a meeting or go and talk to people, and if they're not impressed, well, it's just casual, thank you for your time anyway. There's follow-up. I've got them to commit to write down contact details and say they want some, more information, and maybe they're not in a position to do a course or an assignment, 
but there's an interesting order, they've got other things happening. That's okay, that's no great loss, but then there's fulfillment. It's actually doing the editor-thon, doing the educational assignment, and then it's really important that they have a good experience. Um, and I should mention about the, the distinctive university culture of the UK. So traditionally, it's been very academic-led. And countries' education systems differ. Uh, some are very management driven or government policy driven. Uh, some are, I suppose, the Ivy League and the states are over here uh, in sort of very much driven by the community of scholars. Um, and the UK was sort of historically, but it's become more managerial. And there's different cultures in different universities. Some are very managerial, some are uh, more academic led. So at the moment, there's, and it's, that's still changing, but at the moment, there's kind of supported, directed autonomy. Lecturers have, course leaders have that freedom to decide what they're going to teach and how they're going to assess it, but it's got to be, it's got to fit certain goals set by the institution or the or, or national policy. Um, so, uh, they've got bureaucracy to deal with and they've got to get things signed off by different bodies. Um, but they have some freedom, but they're supported. There are thousands and thousands of people whose job is to support innovation and change in, in university teaching. So that's the kind of idea that we can reach through that, those networks of supporting people and those professionals. That's a way to have lots of national change. So I'm trying to make Wikipedia Education Assignments a mainstream option that people have, not that they take, but, but something that they can be proud of, not something they have to shuffle in or, or under the radar and not really tell their institutions about. So, uh, so academia a long time ago was just a profession of um, men dressed in robes. Um, uh, so, but, but now it's very different, and there's a whole context of other things, other people they have to relate to. There, there's, like I say, there's policy. So a policy drive from the government would be universities should have more work-related skills, which should prepare people more for the workplace while they're teaching after academic stuff, I mean, that might drive those decisions. Um, there's accreditation, there's peer relations like the scholarly societies, um, and then supporting uh, things like the librarians, like the learning support people, the technology people in the university. All these other influences, they could make Wikipedia assignments really hard to do. They could put bureaucratic blocks, or they could not support it, or not approve it, or they could make it really easy to do. So when sort of the bottom up process of academics coming around to this, you know, Wikipedia education seems to be a good idea, they get all the support and approval from their head of department and their, their college principal and the people they work with. So, so that's the sense which is top down. There are top down influences, even the things which are supporting, like support staff, they have national professional bodies and they have leaders and managers. We talk to them and influence that nationally, as well as working in support with funders and other bodies then that's kind of top-down, creating the environment for bottom-up initiatives to succeed. So I'll talk about a few of these things, not a lot of them. In each case, I'm thinking, what do we offer them? What do we want to be in the Wikipedia education community that's common for what they want to what we offer? And in, so in UK universities, there's always a unit, it's got a different name in every university. It could be the teaching support unit, or teaching enhancement unit, or learning support unit. Sometimes it's technology dedicated, so the technology and learning department or unit, or, so they have different names. But these are, so these are the people who, when virtual learning environments came along, did the workshops to train the lecturers to use virtual learning environments and to stop using the boxes from the paper and the office. And so they, those professionals want more examples of that, more skills that they can acquire themselves that are maybe related to technology or innovative learning that they can pass on to the academics they work with. And so those are the most enthusiastic people about coming to the, sort of a Wikimedia training workshop and, and spending time learning stuff. They want skills that they that distinctive to this that they can pass on. And so they, you get them trained up, and they don't run courses. They're not course leaders. That doesn't mean that Wikipedia assignment's going to happen. But they are the people who will know the sort of enthusiastic academics who are maybe open to doing Wikipedia assignments. And they're the people who are in a position to support it um, 
maybe access to campus ambassador, maybe, maybe helping us about. University librarians, a really important sector. Um, uh, some of them are really defensive and sort of against the open agenda because their job is to promote paid subscription resources and to get students using them. And so they, they're, they're not very really set to some degree. Some are very idealistic about food and education and become librarians for that reason. So, um, but if just getting in front of them and saying that we don't expect Wikipedia to be uh, totally trusted and want people to think critically about it and look at the process behind it. There's a lot of common ground with what they're trying to do. We have a lot of relations with library, librarians, librarian sectors through their professional body, through their conferences, uh, just because we're all sending slides that, that, that university librarians can use in their inductions of students. Um, there's a whole class of researchers who research learning and teaching and how learning happens and innovative styles of learning and teaching in universities. And they'll have intervention blogs and papers. There's a group at University of Leicester uh, that I know that they, they coined the term, I believe, open practice. Uh, so this is idea that you don't just put resources, have open resources, put freely reusable resources online, you create a culture in which people get used to reusing that. And they want a concrete example, it's obviously a nice thing to aspire to, of where people just naturally reuse and adapt open resources, but how do we actually make that a culture and make that an everyday thing? And so we have an example, we've got a community that does that and they want to learn that. So I've cheaply, because I've given research seminars at universities and other topics, I've cheaply got myself onto the research seminar agenda of these places and given a, a seminar about this. And so if they've got hostility or negativity towards Wikipedia, I'll, I'll debate them. I'm happy to do that. And so, again, it won't immediately um, make an assessment, but it, it means that Wikipedia assignments are known about and amongst the sorts of things that people talk about when they talk about the most innovative uh, um, forms of university activity you can do. And they have their own conference communities and being physical residents. What I did think of early on was external examiners. So these are the people who are academics at one university and they go to another university to assess. They look at the assessments and the exams. Are the exams assessing the right sort of thing? Are they covering the topic? And then they'll look at student work and the marks will be given and they'll, they'll sign it off. Is it too demanding? Is it is too easy? And they'll sign off and say it's basically sort of accreditation. This is a legitimate course. They're not going to run the course themselves, but they want examples of a demanding kind of assessment which maybe teaches more skills than just a subject, maybe teaches group working skills and information skills and so on. Um, they just need to know about Wikipedia education assignments, that they, those are a thing, and to be aware of them and their education, their goals, what they're trying to achieve. Because they will suggest to the university, have you tried, if you're trying to prepare people for knowledge work in a global environment, have you tried a Wikipedia education assignment? And academics want to impress the external examiner because the external examiner is assigned a piece of paper that says they want a legitimate degree, so they'll be open to that. So, again, they don't need to be Wikipedians, these people, or to know or even to implement an educational assignment, but they need to know such things exist and achieve certain goals. And um, so I'm focused on the university sector mainly, but obviously there are other sectors. Here in the UK we have a massive and very prestigious university system, but it is small compared to the adult and community learning, the lifelong learning system, so there's people taking uh, literacy classes, or learning to bake bread, or learning to prepare their car, or, or in a lot of cases, computer, people at, with, with no computer skills going to courses to get computer skills. It turns out there's a national body for that, it's called MyAce. I met up with somebody from MyAce, and she came to a conference I organised, I went to a conference they organised, we spoke to people. Um, they're very innovative, they're, they're realising it's a digital world and people need skills for the digital world and to process digital information that comes to them, and they want to create new opportunities. I'm less certain what we can do, but even just being visible to that community, because I'm from the university sector, this is my sector, but 
just being visible to them and saying, hey, we're in the same business. We're promoting lifelong learning, thank you, on a massive scale as well. And hey, do you know that our stuff is free? You, we actually want you to take stuff and adapt it, and your learners can do that and make their own versions. And by the way, it's not just Wikipedia, there's instructional material, wiki books, and other things. And uh, so just getting that message across and getting them aware what our culture is, what we're trying to do. It's really valuable, and they will percolate that down in their conferences and newsletters to nationally. And so I should mention what I'm particularly pleased to be involved with. Uh, in the UK, we have this body called GISC, which is an educational charity. And uh, there's a clip from its website there which explains how they seem to... Uh, they are the UK's expert on digital technologies or education and research. So all the universities and all the, the colleges of further education and lots of, lots of museums, libraries, galleries will look to just for advice on the whole spectrum of stuff technology related. So um, it's got their digital content, IT services in the broader sense, advice, research and development. So this is legal advice, advice about digital formats, um, advice about openness and, and licensing, they're very good on that. But uh, everything IT from sort of internet cabling to practice in the classroom and what you can do with technology that engages students. And so they're a trusted body in this country's education sector and internationally and not just in universities. Early last year they ran a residential course for the heads of learning and teaching from various universities around the country. And they invited me along and I could give, I had a couple of hours to talk about Wikipedia and Wikimedia and as they use educational platforms and what they can do. And then that sparked, after I'd gone, that sparked up a lot of discussion. They saw it in a new way. Um, and uh, yeah, Wikipedia being the environment they work in, they know what the students use it to print their essays from. That's, uh, and then seeing that our Wikimedia point of view is that we don't want it used as a resource to copy and paste on, we want it used as something that's understood critically, that's a really useful message to get across. And to think, oh wow, we could support Wikipedia assignments and improve Wikipedia ourselves. And eventually I got to be the GISC Wikimedia Ambassador, jointly funded by GISC and Wikimedia UK. What a great job title. Uh, people bought me their end of Ferrero Rocher uh, chocolates to celebrate. I don't know if you've seen the advert where the ambassador um, uh, spoils his guests by doing Ferrero Rocher. So there's still, it's officially over. The paid part is over. I'm still in contact and it's still doing follow up work and there will be uh, follow up activities. But I got to go round universities on behalf of GISC offering workshops to the kind of people we've been talking about, the support staff and librarians and managers and academics, um, so, but it's on behalf of GISC to explore ways that working with Wikimedia could benefit these people's work in, in research or teaching. And um, yeah, we did a lot of documentation, so I've shaped the advice that this trusted body is giving to the whole sector to include Wikimedia advice and advice on using and shooting Wikipedia alongside the other types of advice they give. And so that's mentioning. Imagine if I create Pultopedia and some staff from Pultopedia tell you it would be a good idea to contribute work with Pultopedia. Some, somebody volunteers for Pultopedia and some guy tells you Pultopedia is great, get on board. You'd file it away, yeah, maybe I'll look at that sometime. But if the professional organisations you work with tell you an advisor would work with Pulsopedia, you'll, you'll make it a priority. You'll, you'll see it as uh, part, of the, part of your job. And so we have had publications, so that the flagship publication of JISC is this glossy online magazine called JISC in Four. <laughs> And they ran an article with advice and links on using Wikipedia. And this was their most popular item they had that month. And it was maybe only seen by 50,000 people in that week, but it's 50,000 of the right people, support staff, university managers, people across the education sector in the UK and beyond. Um, again, coming from, not, not from Wikipedia, but coming from GISC. 
Uh, and also just has this relationship with the, the uh, professional body for library and information professionals. So we got an article onto the front page of the CIDIP. Uh, and so I had reached thousands of people. It was much discussed. I don't know if you can see the Twitter, 337 mentions on Twitter. It reached thousands of people, but thousands of the right people, librarians, information professionals, uh, people working in universities. And, so, and this is when I learned that if you take Mike Peel's photo of my face and kind of compress it down to a certain it really seems so. <laughs> But that's great to be able to talk to academics and support staff about Wikipedia and education without, without being some guy who edits Wikipedia, but being in the sector as a trusted body. Uh, I won't talk about that. But I haven't focused much on metrics for the success of this project. And you see, it's difficult. So there will be metrics for articles edited and users, but the, the things down the line. But I'm working in this way, kind of top down, is kind of high risk. Occasionally, you'll get um, things happening really quickly, much quickly, more quickly than you thought. And then sometimes you put lots of effort in and you've, you've got people really excited, but they're not the right people with the right job titles in the organisation, and you've just got to wait. Or I maybe mean, you get the message through to people twice, and like I say, you've actually got to get through to people four times before they've actually changed their behaviour. So I think it's like a dripping tap that we're seeing uh, changes. We're, I think we're seeing rapid cultural change, because we were expecting scenes outside the academy and not to be touched, but now we're getting this kind of professional uh, endorsement by professional societies. Um, so, driven to the occasional actual practical things happening a few and far between, but become more rapid and become a flood if you've got an awful town. It's uh, not a good metaphor. But, um, so I think there are metrics. In the next few years, the outcomes of what I'm doing now will become more visible and actually have measurable impact on Wikipedia. Um, and I'm more, I'm still now in what I've called the follow-up stage, I've done the outreach and then this follow-up, because we've had so many people who have you know, specific requests and things I'd like to do. And then it will be fulfillment and maybe enlightenment. I'm going to miss out that. That is my presentation and suggestions, and now I have time for questions. Psychology Wikipedia project for A level students. For A level but, so this is uh, eight, 18 plus. Uh, uh, level. 16 to 18. 16 to 18, so this is school leaver level qualification uh, okay. So I think it is possible. I mean, what the work I've been talking about here is mostly done by final year undergraduates yeah. doing a topics on where they'd normally be doing a dissertation. So yes. instead of doing a dissertation, throwing them right into the course, they're doing something. Yeah. This but, yeah, I, I think in other things, I think like in wiki books, like create, instead of saying here's the textbook for A-level psychology, you say we're going to create a textbook for A-level psychology or some aspect we're focusing on, and then how are we going to do that, well how does the textbook author do it, do you look at different sources, and so you can very customise it because you're setting the scope of what this book is going to be, and you're deciding as, as a class what we're going to work on, maybe they just have to get a paragraph or some interesting fact. And um, so I think looking beyond Wikipedia is a good idea. Uh, but yeah, the, the psychology cabal on Wikipedia, get in touch with us and we're keen to help you. But yeah, please do approach me and get a call. Yes, yeah, please do get in touch with us. What? Is, uh, I was wondering if there are reactions from the governmental side, so from the education ministry or... Um, so, like, is that... Because I think this is a really uh, good approach to, to have a broader reach than, for example, doing small workshops. Yeah. But um, I was still wondering, because the, the, the topic of your submission is also changing education system, and I was just wondering how, is there any reaction from the governmental side 
like, or are they seeing it? Okay, is there any reaction from the government side? And I put the government as a kind of an influencer on my chart, but actually I haven't been going to the education minister. But we can use kind of the leverage of education policy. So policy says students have got to learn more actively, people, more diverse people have got to go to universities, people with more diverse backgrounds than traditionally gone to universities have got to, to go to university now. So, so people with different educational backgrounds. So um, we can't rely on kind of traditional methods of university education. It's, it's not got to be so bookish. It's got to involve people in activities. And then there's targets like, um, yeah, expands the information skills, you know, prepare people for working in the world of, of knowledge and being knowledge workers, because that's what most jobs are now. And so the government's already saying those kind of abstract goals, and then you go to the universities and say, you can achieve these goals with Wikipedia as I'm actually getting people making open content. So kind of the government policy is actually, but yeah, I think there's a role for government, but there definitely is, because but in the case of open access to research, so there's been you know, a long time campaign for open access to the access of the search, and it's, but it's now happening in this country. And what the, the precipitating event that made that happen was we had a minister who's doing some research at home, the minister of uh, the universities of science, and he kept hitting paywalls. He wasn't on the parliamentary network, and he, he it's absurd. I had to pay these huge prices to read research which has been paid for by the public. And he initiated this review. And then what's happened with the government and the search councils, the funders, is to say any, is to move towards a situation where any research funded by the public has all its outputs on open access and, and usually, but not always, under, under free licenses, with be compatible licenses. So that decision by a few people takes along the whole sector. And remember, there, there's open access advocates and enthusiasts and maybe they're stick in the muds and think everything's fine as it is and oppose change. But there's a, a huge bulk of professionals in the middle don't care. By the way, they want, they want to do their jobs and advance their career. And if the, you advance your career by doing open access stuff, they'll do that. And if you do it by closing access, they'll do that. So in the same way, I, I think if we don't have this top-down element, we'll reach the enthusiast but won't reach the bulk. And the techniques I'm talking about are kind of reaching the bulk. Even if, like I say, even if the bulk say, um, this looks difficult and intimidating, and I don't want to barge in that moment I'm doing, so I don't know anything. That's still a good outcome, because that's an informed choice, rather than it's Wikipedia or no such. So, so, yeah, eventually I'll go and talk to the minister and see what's yeah. What feedback are you getting from academic historians? What feedback from academic historians? Yeah. So, so I'm not at a stage yet where I can do subject-specific workshops. I basically invite anybody from any subject, and then I ask them what their issues are. Um, so there's not like a good sample size of historians yet. I think there's enthusiasm from humanities equally as from scientists. Once, once they hear what I'm offering, it, we're not selling something much. We have convergent aims, are we? Um, and. Yeah, I think his, when there's a historical element, that often, if it's not recent history, there's an out of copyright element, and there's an element of getting documentation of uh, things that happen on time out in the open and seeing where they're seen by a lot of people. And that's understood to be a good thing. And you could get students to do it. So it's educational goals and public awareness goals and supporting research. That total win-win. But uh, yeah, you've got to reach people. Obviously, it's a self-selecting sample of people who come to my workshops and that they're not totally put off by the idea of the community. But there's enough people in that category. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Thank you. What can students think? Uh, what can they expect from the What are the range of responses I see from students, particularly if they're working in teams? I think initially, they just see Wikipedia as just a different delivery method for their essay. They still see it as they're, they're writing an essay, but they deliver it by uploading it to Wikipedia rather than uploading it to the Dropbox or Turnitin or whatever they would have to do. And 
Uh, and that's a misconception. And like the community, they don't even see, they don't even think that's part of it. it as soon as they get feedback that's polite and that suggests where they can improve it, and like thanks them for, you know, I know they've been assigned to do it, I'm still going to thank them for improving the computer because they're doing a good thing. Then once they've had some interaction which is good, then it changes. And um, so, yeah, they've been assigned to do it, they've got to do it as requirements. It's not like they've been bell, they feel held by optimism to improve Wikipedia. But it can be a good or it can be a bad experience for them. And yeah, they're different for different people. So, um, yeah, maybe having really good campus ambassadors who, not, who don't just train but inspire. I know there are such people, but they're in short supply. Uh, maybe that's important. Is my time up? Thank you very much for this week's discussion. Thank you very much. No, don't leave. There's a. Um, so you see that place there? Um, it's mine. I don't have a tower with me, but it's mine. And I can decide. But someone can uh, take it, you don't have to sit on the ground. Just can be a question mark. Um, I'm absolutely a fan of this uh, Barbican Center because it reminds me of British uh, 70s science fiction. And this is actually the first time I'm talking in a room which is bended. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I believe it has something to do with the creation of artificial gravity. So it's really useful, but uh, I hope uh, I can keep in uh, visual contact with all of you. My laptop is having Wi-Fi trouble. Oh, I have. Sorry about that. I have it on USB. I have it on USB. Don't go away. I would like to share with you and I am I hope that later we will have a little Q and A questions and annotations so that you can give some feedback and I can learn from you. Who am I? I'm Zico van Dijk. I'm a German who lives in the Netherlands and my way to Wikipedia uh, was editing Wikipedia. There are several ways but that's my way. I'm usually on German Wikipedia writing about history. I have been on the board of the Dutch chapter. I have been in the Referentenprogramm, the 
presenters program of the German chapter. And when in 2013 the German chapter Wikimedia version abolished that, we went on with the Wiki team, which is a loose network of people like me, and you can uh, hire us for a school, a university, for a talk, for teaching Wikipedia, editing, and so on, and so on. So if, if you've got a problem, and there's no one who can help, and if you can find us, maybe you don't want to hire one of the Wiki team. I'm going to talk to you about motives or expectations, like the the surrounding of everything we are doing, we must always be very clear about our expectations and the expectation of others that people do not become frustrated. How to, to prepare yourself, uh, something about content I'm giving to the people and I'm showing to you some slides. Of course, this is personal, people have different styles, how they make slides, what they like, and I'll give you some examples of The motive and expectations. And you can uh, look at different point of views. For example, there are people who are going to Wikipedia lessons or an evening where they get information about Wikipedia. Actually, more or less, no one of those people is interested in Wikipedia. Might sound odd, but those people they are not going to have a new hobby. They just want to have a nice evening or a Saturday when they learn something new. And it doesn't mean that they are interested intrinsically in encyclopedias or writing or Wikipedia. They are interested in their own lives and what is dear to them. That's fine. So we must find something that is overlapping. A couple of weeks I have been in Germany for one day of a whole seminar that was one week by the trade union for their members and it was about Google and those dangerous things on the internet I mean. So I was going to talk about Wikipedia and the organizers of the seminar told me well, Zico, uh, there are not only white collar workers, also blue collar workers you have teachers in your audience, others are standing at the manufacturing belt of Volkswagen, so you should um, consider that. Also, many of those people, well, how could they be interested in Wikipedia? For example, they have children at school, so there are some topics about Wikipedia in schools. So I, I knew one of the organizers who worked, worked together at a project at a university, so, so she said, she had some suggestions, what could be interesting for, those, for that audience, for that seminar. And so I prepared a little part about schools. There was a little discussion in Germany in the news about the indecency of some Wikipedia articles for content. You know, is it suitable for pupils? Uh, should Wikipedia be used in schools? So I, I prepared something about that. Funny, it turned out that uh, it was totally unnecessary. Because the seminar participants were so interested in Wikipedia and manipulations on Wikipedia, the structure of the move movement, who is in authority, those questions, very political questions, and that was great. And, the and, and we saw that the difference between highly educated and less educated, formally educated participants, it, it turned out to be rather irrelevant. It wasn't that important. So we were prepared, okay. Uh, the organizers were happy, their objectives were met, the participants were happy because it turned out not to be as boring as they supposed it to be, and they were happy, I was happy. <laughs> it was not something helpful for Wikipedia or for the movement, but for them, and well, I wasn't paid by the chapter, I was paid by that trade union uh, institution. So who is giving, who is ordering uh, those Wikipedia lessons, and yes, who is your customer, what do they want? Uh, if you go to a school, the school teacher wants the children to learn something. They are not interested in creating new Wikipedians. You should be aware of that. So when you are a volunteer, you go to the school, and you do something with the children, maybe it's, it's fun for you, great. 
But please don't believe that you are doing something good for Wikipedia. You are actually then a volunteer for that school. If you're happy with that, fine. If not, you should not have wrong expectations. Wrong expectations lead to frustrations. About expectations, this is a text from a German organizer of um, People's University Lessons about Wikipedia. I give you some time to read this. about why senior citizens should be interested in editing Wikipedia. They have so much knowledge, they experience so much in their life that they can be valuable contributors. And I'm afraid such a text can only lead to frustrations because editing Wikipedia is not about what you experience in your life. It is essentially about reading books and quote from them in a more or less scientific way so when those people come to Wikipedia, they must learn that uh, the expectations that were created were not quite accurate. Another example, and always keep in mind, what kind of hobby is Wikipedia? Because we are actually talking about a hobby. Come to Wikipedia and become a part of the wisdom of the crowds. That's very common in, in advertising text for Wikipedia lessons. Don't worry to make an error of and so on and so on. And again, this is not an accurate description of the Wikipedia hobby. You write an article, you make edits on Wikipedia, and uh, I don't want to sound cynical, this is how our Dutch uh, chapter director put it. If you do something on Wikipedia, and no one complains, nobody complains, you are actually fine. You did everything fine. It's, it's, it's not really a place, it's not a social media place, in the way that you get a lot of positive, nice feedback from others who are helping you editing and improving your Wikipedia. It's a solitary thing. And if you are lucky, people help you. If not, not. We have often seen uh, in the university where I let students uh, create articles that often there isn't much response after. Someone comes to add a category, but nothing much happens. Again, what hobby is Wikipedia? Don't create wrong expectations. And why do you want to give Wikipedia lessons? Well, you can have personal motives of any kind, like you like to present yourself, talk about your hobby Wikipedia, that's fine if you don't exaggerate. Uh, on the other hand, uh, why should the Wikimedia movement use chapter, uh, should use Wikipedia donations or the goodwill of their, uh, of their volunteers for something that is not really helping Wikipedia, it's not creating new editors, it's not uh, creating incredible new, uh, new content. I'll give you an example. I have been once hired or paid a little money at travel expenses by Wikimedia Deutschland, the German chapter, to go to a place in Germany and uh, it was an international, no, it was a conference on encyclopedia. So they got the invitation in Berlin, and the German chapter said, Zico, would you like to represent us, talk about Wikipedia? I found it just fine. I got a little bit paid, and I had the opportunity to go to that city where my brother was a student. So I could meet him, and I tell him in advance, talk about, that's the program, and he said, oh, you mean I can get dinner and lunch for free? Okay, yes, that was just fine for him. Uh, he's a smart guy in the family. He has a PhD. So we went there, and it turned out not exactly to be a conference. It was in a restaurant, it was really nice, and it was the retirement party of a gentleman who 40 years ago 
establish a small business that was reselling encyclopedias and dictionaries to students. And now he was older and retired, the business wasn't going that well, you can imagine. And while I was there, someone, a business partner from Encyclopedia Britannica, quite interesting, there was there were songs and a little bit mockery, uh, this roasting or toasting, how you call it in English, very nice, uh, was fun. My brother looked at me <coughs> with some bewilderment, and I told him, Toby, this is the celebrating culture of the traditional petit bourgeois of Western Germany, which is dying out just as the business of that gentleman over there. So enjoy it while it exists. It was nice, it was fun, I don't regret it, but uh, I, I wouldn't have been there if I wouldn't have been uh, paid. And I told you the German chapter, well, this is something you shouldn't do in the future. You know, it doesn't bring the movement further. Um, I don't want to say that the gentleman tricked us with his invitation for a conference that looked very like a conference, a program, but uh, when your chapter or you yourself as a volunteer get an invitation, to go to such a place and, and you have to pay with your time or your money, well, you should ask some questions and consider twice whether you really want to go there. I must tell you. Preparations. There are a lot of things you can prepare for and I can just advise learn as much as possible about wikis, the concept of free knowledge and encyclopedias. It is so helpful and people will be so grateful. You can know in advance that people want to hear about encyclopedias. They have certain ideas, like uh, in, in olden times, Encyclopedia Britannica, you know, it was very refined, much control. Many people checked the articles, and if you learn a little bit about the history of encyclopedias, you know it's just not true. Encyclopedia Britannica meant there was one person, uh, an editor, and contacted an author, and the author, a professor of something, wrote a short piece of text. The person at Encyclopedia Britannica uh, copy edited that and made it uh, conforming to the standards of, of, um, of the writing style of the Britannica. That was all. And you compare that to Wikipedia, where you can have a nice discussion about what is the better system. Also, preparation means uh, go to Google News and enter Wikipedia, and then you will see what is a topic that is covered in the press. People will love that, because then they understand that you are talking about something that is fresh, and that you are learning and learning, and giving new information, for example, about that monkey selfie that is now going to the page. Content. Wikipedians tend to believe, well, they have an encyclopedic character, and Wikipedians tend to believe that something is not correct if it is not complete. And that can mean they tend to put many, many, many single topics into the presentation. And if I would now blank this after a couple of seconds and ask you how many of these topics you remember, well, you remember them fine, you are often Wikipedians, Wikipedians, but it would be terrible. I always uh, recommend talk about a few topics extensively so that uh, you can really thoroughly explain what are the important things for us. And well, it can be that easy. Those are our basic principles. But of course, if you are going to an organization that is dealing about international movements, uh, international uh, relations, well, you can have other topics. Um, I want to make, as we have the time, talk a little about some topics, whether you would include them in your presentation or not. Co-founder or founder, will be as the founder or will be here or the co-founder, you know the discussion. Won't you talk about that in your presentation? Co-founder or not co-founder? Who do that? No, who says yes? Yes? Yes. Who says no? No? Sorry? by the party. So it's not that important? No? Yes, okay. I would say no, unless Jimmy Wayne is for any reason the center of your presentation. For any reason. 
But I do this to show Wikipedia is not an NFT. There are rules, and I use the color blue for the rules we have chosen for, neutrality we have chosen for, uh, what kind of sources we use, that's the decision of Wikipedia. In red, this light red, this is based on law, what we cannot change, what we have to apply in other ways. And I use the color green for the positive, nice social things like no personal attacks. And then I have some I R uh, I I A R ignore all rules. I have this there. I don't mention it by them by myself. Mostly people mention it and ask for that, and then I know oh people are actually listening and they have questions. And I tell them it's wiki folklore. Okay, so it will be a rule. This is a slide about the uh, structure of the Wikipedia, the Wikimedia movement, and I'm always told, Zico, uh, you can't show that to anybody. This is just crazy, you know. And uh, what I really, just to show, it's complicated, I know, but that's not important. It's important to show some essentials about the structure of the movement, and this is my surrogate. The three fields of the Wikimedia movement and I chose the color because of the logo colors, of course. And you see this blue around, yeah? the, the uh, frame is in blue. That's a little hint. It's the Wikimedia Foundation that is defining the movement. The foundation can say, you are a chapter, you are not. This is also very important in order to show people that this is the Wikimedia movement and those other things like open street map, they can be good, they can be uh, qualified, they can be a wiki, they do something with free knowledge. They don't just belong to us. We are not responsible for them. And please be always very specific. We are not wiki. Hey, wiki friends, we are doing wiki things now. Now, it's Wikipedia, it's the Wikimedia movement. I also always say uh, Wikimedia movement. Yeah, it's clearer. People tend to ask wiki. Wikipedia, Wikimedia, what is the difference? Well, it's just one letter. But Wikipedia, Wikimedia movement, is more distinct. So these were some examples of what I'm doing, and maybe we have later the occasion uh, to interchange what you are doing. And uh, I see I have two minutes, uh, there are two minutes still for questions, or we have the break later. So uh, please, uh, yeah, yeah. thank you very much. that not only the topic but also the audience. I see David. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what do you think about, uh, Speak up, shout. What do you think about introducing visual editor to new users? Ah, visual editor, yes. Uh, this is very, very exciting because we will have to deal with it. And I'm now writing the second, edi edi uh, second edition of my textbook about editing, editing Wikipedia. And I'm not sure whether wait for a couple of months or not. Um, I have no good answer for that, but we, we definitely must do that. But we also should learn about, uh, uh, teach about the wiki code, because people might already need it. But that's really a very unpleasant situation. Yeah? You have to show something in two ways. It, it's always confusing. Good point. Yes. Yes, please. Are your slides online? Uh, the, those slides are online, you find them via the page, the submission, submissions page of Wikimania. And comments, yeah, where it is. So I, I see nothing can uh, come in the competition with coffee on your pupils to see there's no competition. So uh, we give it a break. Yes. So thank you very much.
Yeah, yeah, yeah. 